Sounds promising. Um, well, thanks for coming. It's kind of cool and terrifying to see so many people. Um, I guess I should start by saying who I am. Um, so my name is Matthew Mead Briggs. Um, I am a software engineer at Yelp here in London. Um, I work on a team that's fancily called Distributed Systems. Um, but my day job is working on our platform as a service. So that's the thing we provide to engineers at Yelp to run our website. Um, I can keep the marketing spiel brief, I guess, because you've already heard from Giuliano. Um, our mission is to connect people with great local businesses. Um, it's a mobile app, a website. You leave reviews. You search for businesses, um, plumbers, restaurants. You, know, you get the idea. Um, so what am I going to talk about? Um, yeah, I thought I should tell you up front so that you know what you're in for. Um, I'm going to talk about spot instances and what they are. Um, then I'm going to like move on and talk about spot fleets, which are kind of an abstraction on top of spot instances. Um, I'm going to talk about some lessons learned. Um, some of those were learned the hard way. And I think like if you're thinking about using spot instances, this is the bit that you will care about. Um, then I'm going to go into a bit of high level detail about how we use spot instances at Yelp. Um, and then I've got a conclusion um, at the end. Is it worth it? Um, so you'll have to stick around if you want to find out. Um, you traditionally end your talk by thanking people, but just to be unconventional, I thought I'd start by thanking some people. Um, particularly, I wanted to call, call out two colleagues, uh, Rob and Kyle, who have done similar presentations on both um, auto-scaling at Yelp and spot instances at Yelp. Um, and they very kindly let me borrow some slides and graphics and stuff, so big thank you to them. Um, so yeah, let's get going. Um, I want to start by like reminding everyone the different ways you can pay Amazon for compute. Um, probably you're all familiar with the like on-demand option. It's the simple one. You request a computer from Amazon. You pay now by the second, I think. And when you turn it off, you stop paying. It's very straightforward. All the prices for the different instances are published. It's, it's easy, right? Um, the second way is reserved instances. Um, so if you're willing to pay up front and for uh, like at least a year, you can get a pretty hefty discount from Amazon. Um, and it does depend on like what instance type you're buying, but it's something in the region of about 40%. So if you're going to be leaving your on-demand instances on for a year, you definitely want to be thinking about reserved instances. And the final thing is what I'm going to talk about today, which is spot instances. Um, maybe actually just we'll pause here and can, can you raise your hand if you've heard of spot instances before? Oh, wow, that's good. So I'm going to be preaching to the choir a bit. Um, let's have another show of anyone that's actually using them. Ah, <laughs> OK, so maybe not. Um, that's, that's cool. Um, so what are they? Well, it's Amazon's way of auctioning spare capacity. So obviously, Amazon have to fill some rooms with computers somewhere. Um, and the paying customers for these first two types come along and use some of those computers. But they're always going to have some spare, right? Um, and they might as well sell those to anyone who's willing to pay less. And that's the whole idea. It's essentially an auction for spare capacity. Um, and the trade-off is that if these paying customers come back and need those computers, Amazon will kick you off. So you're more likely to get interrupted. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot more about interruptions as we go along. Um, I thought I should like tell you what the motivation is here, because it's actually pretty simple. Um, there's, two, there's two things. Um, number one is the money. Um, I haven't told you the like, discount on spot instances, because I'm saving that for the punchline at the end. Um, but our whole goal here is that they're cheaper, so we're going to save some money. Um, we have another motivation, which is don't let the website go down. Um, I'm going to talk later as well about what we actually use these for at Yelp. But the spoiler is we do run our website on them. Um, so if they all disappear, we serve users this like happy error page. Um, the cute dog is based on a real-life dog called Darwin, um, who allegedly, when Yelp was a lot smaller than it is now, chewed through an Ethernet cable. Um, and to this day, he dawns our error pages. So, um, so right, I'm going to try and explain how spot instances work. Um, I'm going to start by talking about spot markets. So um, spot instances, you pay uh, a price, and that price is defined in different markets. And those markets are essentially per AZ and per instance type. So each, you can imagine that like Amazon have spare capacity and they have spare of certain instances in each availability zone. Um, so if you think about this, 
and you think EU West 1 has three AZs, and there's roughly 70 instance types now. I was like counting them by hand, so that might not be that accurate, but it's about that. So that's 210 spot markets, 210 different prices um, for Amazon instances just in EU West 1. And obviously, like similar sized regions will have something similar. So how do you pay for this spare capacity? Um, I'm going to try and run through this like fancy simulation. Um, I think it's kind of a nice way of understanding it. Um, but it's not the like, easiest thing to wrap your head around. And I will spoil the end of this um, portion by saying that Amazon have actually changed how some of this works. Um, now, I think it's like useful historical context to know this, so I want to go through it. But if you're not following, like, don't panic. Um, I'll try and explain it slowly. So this thing on the right shows the like, servers that Amazon have. Uh, you can see that four in use, three available. And this thing on the left here shows the price that different customers are willing to pay. They've all placed a bid, and some of them are a bit high, some of them are a bit low. Now, there's three spare, so obviously the three highest bidders win. Uh, there's someone bidding five, four, and three dollars. Um, the interesting bit is that what they all end up paying is actually the price that the lowest person is bidding. So you can see in the top it says the current price is three dollars because that's the lowest one. And these other people that are bidding, they're not bidding enough, so they're just not getting those, those servers. Now, you can imagine that like, one of these real paying customers might just stop their instance. And if that happens now, there's another slot for the next highest bidder, who, as it happens, is also bidding $3. So they now get their computer, um, but the price hasn't changed. Everyone's still paying $3. Now, if it happens again, there's another free slot, and now the next highest bidder gets in. This person's only bid $2, so the price that everyone is paying now drops. Now, we go the other way. We can imagine that those customers who stop their instances come back, like maybe their load has spiked or it's Black Friday or something. Um, now, everyone has been outbid apart from one person. There's still one spare computer, and that person bid the highest, so they get it. And because they bid $5, and that's the lowest bid now, they're paying $5, regardless of whether that's more or less than the on-demand price. So I said things have changed. Um, so what changed? Um, well, around the time of uh, reInvent last year, so sort of November 2017, um, Amazon realized that they could make some changes that would lower the overall number of, of interruptions that occur. Um, essentially, what they did is it's no, they set so the spot price is no longer set to the lowest fulfilled price. Um, and instead, it only fluctuates based on the actual spare capacity that they have. Um, and they smooth this to some extent. Um, and as a result, the price no longer fluctuates nearly as much as it used to. Um, your bid is no longer really a bid. It's basically now just a maximum price that you're willing to pay. Um, and so there's basically now two ways that you can be interrupted. You can still be interrupted if your maximum bid that you're willing to pay is not as high as the market rate. But the other way that you can now be interrupted that you couldn't before is if Amazon need the spare capacity. And What's really changed is the order in which they choose who to evict. So it used to be that they chose the lowest bidder. Is the lowest right? Um, but now they determine the order by Amazon EC2. That's a direct quote from the documentation. Um, it's very vague, right? Um, I think it's deliberately the case. Now, we can like, make some guesses. Um, maybe if you know someone at Amazon, you can ask them. But I, I suspect it's something like time. So maybe they terminate the oldest, instance, oldest spot instances now. But the crucial thing is it's no longer related to the price you bid. Um, so essentially, like, the way to think about this is before, the price that people in the market were bidding and the spare capacity dictated how likely you were to get interrupted. Now it's just the spare capacity. What you bid has no effect on it. Cool. So I wanted to say another major thing about spot instances. I've talked about interruptions quite a bit, and I've said that Amazon just terminate your instance. Well, it's not strictly true. You actually get some warning, and you get two minutes. So that's nice, right? Um, some of you will almost certainly be familiar with this um, magic IP address that you can hit from any EC2 instance, and it produces some metadata. Um, there is a specific endpoint, this one here, which is available on spot instances, and will tell you whether Amazon are about to reclaim your instance. But it'll only give you two minutes. So if you're clever, you can like watch this and use it to do something special. 
um, and I'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, it's worth saying that there is like a more modern thing as well. They now support SNS, so you can trigger SNS and have your Lambda function do something clever if you're into that stuff. So I hope you're now thinking, these spot instances sound cool. Um, they're cheaper, why wouldn't I use them? Um, and if you're really clever, you're thinking, well, that sounds great, but if I'm running these spot instances and they get reclaimed, and they all get reclaimed, um, what am I gonna do? Um, well, luckily Amazon have got you covered, and they thought about this too, and they produced a thing called Spotfleet. Um, so what is Spotfleet? Well, uh, if you know what an ASG is, it's kind of analogous. Um, it's a way of launching a mass of spot instances and then keeping the capacity at set amount. Um, you are able to dictate which instance types you're willing to run, and the interesting thing here is to remember the spot market thing of every instance type in every AZ being a different market. And for each one, you can give a weight. And I'll talk more about the weights later, because that's kind of crucial. So the really cool thing about this is that as well as just like replacing hardware failures or whatever an ASG does, spot fleets will also respond to the outbid events in an like, intelligent way. So if you get outbid on a particular instance type, the spot fleet will pick some of the other instance types and try and replace those instances. Um, so you're no longer as at much at risk of those interruptions, even though you are going to get some. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the, like, this is just kind of a detail on how spot fleets work. When you request them, you can specify an allocation strategy. Um, maybe you can guess which one I think is best. Um, it's, it's definitely up to you. Um, it's hopefully obvious what they mean. So if you choose the least price one, and you've given an array of instances that you think are acceptable, Amazon will select the ones for your fleet based on whichever ones are cheapest right now. Um, so you will save a bit more money. The diversified one means that they will balance the ones they choose over all the ones you select. And that way you minimize the number of interruptions you're gonna get. Um, if you're running a website, you definitely want diversified. Uh, and don't be fooled, you're still gonna save loads of money. Um, don't like cheap out and choose least price if you actually care about the interruptions. So maybe now you're like really sold and thinking, wow, this sounds like you've got it all, right? Um, so how, how do we go about doing this? Well, you can go into the console like everything in AWS, click around, select the instance types, click all the drop downs and the security groups and all that, all that stuff. Um, that's good for playing around, right? But I'm not gonna do that in real life. Um, maybe you're a secret old school sysadmin like myself and you like CLIs. Um, you could use the AWS CLI and request a spot fleet and specify the instance types with a big blob of JSON. But maybe you wanna do this properly um, and write some code. Um, naturally, that's what we do. Um, there's lots of options. You can do CloudFormation, Ansible, whatever. Uh, we use Terraform, and hopefully this will give you some idea of what it looks like. Um, don't worry too much about the like, specifics in here. Um, I just wanted to show something that gave you an example of what a Terraform manifest at Yelp for a spot fleet looks like. Um, you can see there's different variables for things like regions. Um, there's like a target capacity. Um, all your like normal Amazon stuff. Um, the thing that I want to like talk about most is the instance data. So this is just like shorthand for um, Terraform to load a file. And this is what that file looks like, or an example of what it could look like. Um, this is where you specify the instance types you're willing to run. And this is crucial to your success, right? So you want to diversify across as many as possible, which I've kind of already hinted at probably. Um, but you also want to select a weight. So at Yelp, most of our clusters are bound by CPU, so it kind of makes sense for us to weight our instances by CPU. Um, so if we look at like a C44XL, we know it's got 16 vCPUs, so we randomly ascribe 0.15 as the weight. We know a C48XL has 36, so it's two and a bit more times, so we assign two and a bit more times weight to it. And then when you request the capacity for your spot fleet, it'll balance it so that you get the right capacity, but from a selection of these instance types. So I promised you some lessons learned. Um, we've made it. Um, this is the one slide to pay attention to if you're really thinking about doing this. Um, so the first one is balancing between AZs. Um, if you use ASGs, you're probably like familiar with the fact that they can automatically balance between AZs. Um, this may or may not be important to you. It's totally important to me. Um, 
we want to balance both because if we lose an AZ, we don't want to lose half our capacity, or we'd rather only lose a third, right? Um, we also, at Yelp, have like databases and things that are statically provisioned underneath our website that just sit there and don't change. And if we just suddenly migrated everything into one AZ, we'd overwhelm all that stuff underneath. So balancing is important, but spot fleets don't give you this for free. Um, the solution is kind of hacky but simple. Just run multiple spot fleets, one per AZ. You know, it's not ideal, but it works fine. Um, what's next? Yeah, so updating spot fleets is painful. Um, and I can actually be a bit more generic than this and say, I don't think the spot fleet API is the best thing that Amazon have ever produced. They're pretty good at APIs, and this is not my favorite one. Um, updating is painful because you can really only update the capacity. You can't change the type of instances, that JSON file that I talked about. Um, you can't change the AMI without recreating it. Um, so you are gonna have to do some orchestration. We've got Terraform to help us do some of it, but there's still like some pain there. Um, and just in general, be prepared for it to like maybe not be the nicest Amazon API experience that you've ever had. Right, so I've hinted at this, right? Diversification is key. It's just like investing money. Um, the, more, the more baskets, the less you lose when one of those baskets catches fire. Um, so diversify to as many instance types as possible. It's totally a business decision, and this is the like, interesting thing. You've got to think about which instance types you can actually run on. Um, so at Yelp, we can't just stick a bunch of T2 micros in our, in our pool because stuff will start running on them, and it's going to be too slow, right? Our users are going to complain. So you need to think about things like performance and what, what you're actually running on those instances. So be ready for the interruptions. Um, they will come, so you need to be like, prepared for them, and you need to do your best to like, orchestrate around them. Um, and this is what I'm going to talk a bit more about. But before I do, um, I thought I'd like, share some graphs to like, demonstrate the war stories and kind of prove to you that this was, some of this stuff was learned the hard way. Um, so you're probably looking at this and wondering, what in the world is it? Um, so I'll do my best to explain. It's a graph. Um, this, this axis is, is time. You knew that, right? The y-axis doesn't have a uh, label or units, but it's essentially virtual CPUs. Um, and the interesting thing is that the color is by instance type. So this represents a spot fleet in one of our clusters, and the number of CPUs up the side, and the different instance types. And you can actually see that it's not that well diversified, right? These like big yellow chunks are huge. And this pink one here, like between that, that's like half the cluster. So it's not that well diversified. Um, and hey, look, we got, out, we got outbid. Um, I told you it happens. Um, I say outbid, I mean technically now it's just Amazon reclaiming the capacity, but you know what I mean. Um, the good news is that even though we lost like 20% of our cluster here because we weren't very well diversified, the spot fleet did the thing that it's supposed to do, which is launch some new instance types. So you see the new colors appearing here, and it didn't take very long, like, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 minutes or something, um, and that's really just because our bootstrapping is a bit slow. Um, so this is cool, right? It shows the spot fleet doing its thing. Um, but it also teaches you diversify, because 20% is kind of a lot to lose in one go. It could be worse. Uh, and it was. Um, you can see here, again, we're not like very well diversified on this particular point in time. Um, and we got outbid twice. We lost, did we lose these pink ones here? And this, is it the, I can't see what the other color is from here. But we lost two types of instances, nearly half the capacity in one go. Um, the thing that was really bad here is it was one of those horrible things where you've broken two things at the same time and it like multiplies up. We'd broken our, our Puppet infrastructure and we used Puppet to bootstrap our instances at Yelp. Um, and as a result, the spot fleet did its thing of replacing the instances, but they couldn't start. They couldn't join the cluster. Um, and as a result, we've got a like much nastier outage here. Um, you can see the point where we like got Puppet working again because suddenly all the instances came online and the website's okay again. Um, so there's this kind of like bonus lesson here that isn't on my lessons learned slide, which is you are going to like need to trust your bootstrapping process. If you, if you trust that the spot fleet will replace those instances, you've got to know that they're going to come up every time. So let me just grab a sip of water. So how do we use this at Yelp? I'm going to try and dig a little bit deeper uh, and explain how we can get away with this. So we use it for two things. Um, 
I want to talk about Seagull, um, which is the first thing we use it for at Yelp. It's probably a little bit niche, and I'm going to keep it brief because I don't know if it'll be that useful to you. Um, but I think it's really cool, so it's just kind of worth mentioning. It's also the first thing that we use spot instances for at Yelp. It was like our way of working out how they worked. Um, at Yelp, we have a monolith, um, probably like many people. We're breaking it up into microservices. We've made good progress. We've now got hundreds and hundreds of microservices. But surprise, surprise, we've still got that monolith. Um, and it's got 4 million lines of Python, or probably more than that now. Um, and now, as you would hope, if you've written 4 million lines of Python, you've written a lot of unit tests. Um, but unfortunately, if you then want to run those unit tests, that's going to take a long time. Um, and it takes, I don't know how the exact number, but it's like a, probably a day to run the unit tests for Yelp main end to end. Um, so spot instances to the rescue, right? We wrote uh, a Mesos framework and some tooling that allows us to split up those unit tests into bundles of, say, about 10, and then run those on spot instances over like many spot instances. Um, and of course, the spot instances are cheap. And if we lose one, it doesn't really matter because we've just like lost 10 tests. We can like relaunch it on a different instance. Or you know, if we lose a whole run, it's just like one developer trying to run tests. It's not the end of the world. Um, and then obviously, it like collates the results. So you can now like run the tests in 10 minutes again, which is not so bad, right? So that's kind of niche, right? Maybe not many of you have 4 million lines of Python that you're looking after. I hope you don't for your sake. Um, the other thing we have is our platform as a service. Uh, it's cunningly called Pazta, uh, which I do type in text messages talking about the Italian food type. Um, what, is, what is Pasta? So it, it's a bunch of like Python and services that we use to allow our developers to run things at Yelp. They can run web services. They can run batches, long-running workers, one-off tasks, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and it's really a bunch of like Python daemons and um, glue code on top of some open source products. Um, so what are those open source products? Um, well, the, the main one is Mesos. Mesos is like a task scheduling um, product, if you like. And on top of it, we have these like frameworks. So these things along the top are all Mesos frameworks. Um, if you are familiar with Kubernetes, which you're maybe more likely to be, um, this stuff at the top is all kind of equivalent to Kubernetes. Um, this is pretty artistic impression, right? It's obviously a lot more complex than this, but I drew some AWS instances along the bottom to give you an idea. Um, and the idea is that Pasta talks to these frameworks, and Mesos then runs tasks on, on AWS instances. Um, the tasks can actually be whatever you want. Of course, Docker is the like, trendy thing, right? So naturally, they're Docker containers. Um, and yeah, Pasta is responsible for just like instructing these components and making sure they're doing their job of keeping everything running. Uh, so I thought I should give you like an idea of scale, just so you've got something in your head. Um, we have like three big production clusters, um, and we have roughly 900 services in each one. They're not all microservices that communicate. Maybe 300 of ish are. There's also like I said, long-running workers and all the batches and that kind of thing. Um, each of these services might have like multiple Docker containers running as a, as a way to like scale out, right? So we end up with something like 5,500 containers running in our in our biggest cluster. Um, and to run that, we need quite a bit of computer to run it on. So we need roughly 600 agents. So that's 600 pretty beefy AWS instances. Um, and I think about 80% of that is now on spot. We have like some use cases where it's not sensible to run things on spot. Um, so obviously, we have to keep like some regular on-demand or reserved instances around. And this last one I've like amended since the last time we talked, because we used to span across metal traditional hardware, data center, and AWS. Um, Mesos kind of gives us the flexibility to do that. But we're shutting it all down. It's all end of life. We're, we're fully in the like, AWS world now. Um, so why am I telling you about this? Um, to like, bring it back, the reason this is interesting is because this is what allows us to get away with running spot instances. If this happens, these components take care of the, the like, legwork of replacing the tasks that we've lost. Um, so Mesos and Marathon are particularly the things for long-running services, and they will know that that instance has gone away through like health checking and stuff, and they will try and launch these tasks that are now should be running but aren't somewhere else in the cluster. 
but can we do better than that? Because that's all well and fine, but like that moment where we've lost one instance, we're still under capacity, right? We've lost some things that should be running. So can we do a bit better? Well, you remember the two minute warning, that that's our way to do a bit better, right? Um, so this is what we do, and I've, this is kind of simplified again, and I've tried to like split it in half. So the stuff on the left happens on the agent or on the node on the, on the spot instance, and the thing on the right happens separately. Uh, ha happens, happens centrally, um, or sort of centrally. So we get the two minute warning. Um, the first thing we do is we try and drain connections. So we don't want to interrupt like real users, so we, we take the tasks out of the load balancer, just to be nice. Then we stop all the tasks. Um, and as I said, like Mesos then replaces it. So the only bonus here is we've now done this like with two minutes more warning to give like those tasks a bit, a bit longer to start up. But it's still not ideal, right? We're still under capacity a little bit. So can we do better again? Um, well, the answer is yes, sort of. Um, full disclosure, we don't actually do this at the moment. We, we had this working for a while, but there's a bug in Mesos, which you know, I don't want to go into it. It's painful memory, I guess. Um, but what we can do is we can get the two minute warning, and we can tell the Mesos leader that it's going to put that host in maintenance mode. Um, Pasta's like, central thing then notices this and scales up the affected services. So it goes to these open source components and says, what was running on this host? And then it goes to those services on the central thing in Marathon and Mesos and says, scale those services up, because they're about to lose some instances. Um, as the new ones start, it can like proactively kill the old ones before they disappear anyway. Um, and then we have a little loop sitting here on the agent, which just checks whether all the tasks are gone, or if the two minute timer is up. If it is, we do what we did before, which is our like, best effort, drain the connections, kill the tasks, let, the, let them get replaced. Um, so this is a bit better because you get a head start and you try and actually launch the new tasks before the old ones go away. It's dependent on your Docker images, how long it takes to pull them, where you, whether you've got capacity in the rest of the cluster. It's definitely not perfect, but it means that you can suffer more interruptions on spot without actually causing any impact. Uh, and this brings me to like something that I just want to touch on briefly. This is a huge topic, auto-scaling, and I feel like I could talk about it for hours, um, so I'm not going to bore you with that. Um, but I do want to talk about it because it is kind of related. So why would we want to auto-scale? Um, well, this is why. This is a graph kind of showing Yelp's traffic pattern. Um, you can think of it like requests per second or something like that. Don't worry about the colors. Um, they're not really important. The days of the week are along here. So this is like seven days, I think. And you can see that it's quite like peaky. Um, when people in the US wake up and look for lunch and um, finding plumbers and all this kind of stuff, we get a lot more traffic. And then it drops off. And overnight, there's obviously some baseline people in Europe and other parts of the world using Yelp. Um, but it's, it, it's changing a lot. And if we provision our spot fleets to this capacity, when we're down here, we are wasting a ton of money, right? So we should auto scale. Um, because we have this PaaS that I described, we need to actually auto-scale twice. So Pasta has two auto-scalers. Um, the first one is the service level auto-scaler. Um, you can imagine, he's got another one of my artist's impressions. Um, you can imagine some services running on some instances. Say service two is under higher load. The Pasta service auto-scaler will notice that, and it will instruct those open source components to scale up that service. So we get this. Luckily, we had this spare instance running here, and we've got room to run some more copies of that service. But we've now got a problem, right? We've filled up all of our spare capacity. So we need to do some cluster level auto scaling. So we have a second auto scaler that runs and inspects the state of the whole cluster, the whole spot fleet, how many tasks are running, how much space we have spare. And if we need more, it just instructs the spot fleet to modify the, the capacity, and we get more instances. So why am I talking about this? Well, it's interesting because the hard bit about auto-scaling is actually scaling down. What I've just shown you there is the easy bit, right? We can easily run more Docker containers, and we can easily ask for more spot instances. But if I want to scale down, and I've got, like, say, one task running here, I might still want to kill this and have it run somewhere else. Um, and then I've got to worry about stopping that task, draining it. Um, but the good news is we did some of that work to run on spot. So we've got the code. Um, does it work? Um, well, yeah, basically it does. Um, this is a graph um, pretty similar to those ones I showed you for the outage. You've got time again, and then you've got number of CPUs. Um, 
you can see, like, the first thing to see is that we've fixed the diversification thing, right? You can see we're much better diversified here. We've got about 12 different instance types in our, in our biggest pool. Um, and it's, it's nicely spread. It's like 1 12th for each thing, roughly. So if we lose one, we're not at so much risk anymore. Um, the other thing you can see is that the number of CPUs waxes and wanes in the same way as our traffic pattern. So the auto both the autoscalers are doing their jobs. Um, and this is you know, a pretty good saving, right? Because we've lost like roughly half the CPUs overnight. So we're paying half our spot bill overnight. So is it worth it? I, I promised a conclusion, right? Um, well, clearly it is. Otherwise, why would I have come and done this whole presentation to talk to you about it? Um, <laughs> Here's some, here's some way of trying to visualize it. Um, what does this show? So green is good. You knew that, right? Red is bad. Um, the numbers are the percentage compared to a reserved instance that we are paying uh, from a particular month. I think the, the data is a bit old. It's about six months old, but you know, it probably hasn't changed a huge amount. Um, you can see that it varies a lot by instance type. So if you're paying for a C44 XL on spot, um, in US West 2, you're paying 80%, so like, you know, it's still a 20% discount, but it's not huge, right? You're nearly paying as much as a reserved instance. Um, but if you're happy with like C3 old instances, um, you're only paying like 27%, so that's like, you're only paying a third of the reserved instance price. So that's a pretty massive discount. Um, and on the bottom here, I've got like, uh, maybe some of you won't even be able to see this, but I've got like averages for, the, for the, all of the instances in those three regions. Um, and it, it comes out about 50%. Um, so, you know, that's a pretty substantial discount. Um, and if you're operating at a big enough scale, that's totally worth it. Um, of course, there's some engineering time involved in setting up a platform and having Kubernetes or Mesos and all this stuff. Um, but if you're going to do that anyway, then, you know, you might as well run on spot as well. So, um, you know, obviously we're hiring. You knew that, right? Um, I don't even really need to say anything, do I? And uh, has anyone got any questions?